You're listening to the First Baptist Starkville podcast. Be sure to subscribe so you can listen to our sermons as soon as they're available every week. We hope this message will be a blessing to you. To be a Christian simply means to follow Jesus. Jesus, remember what he said? He said he came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And so we can say that we are most like Jesus Christ when we're serving. But how is it, if we're supposed to follow Jesus and he called us to serve, how is it in particular that we're supposed to serve? Are we supposed to do in our own power? Are we supposed to do based upon our own strength? Are we supposed to try to look within and find something within us that causes us this desire to serve? How is it then that we are to serve Jesus Christ? Well, thankfully, we have this Jesus, remember, who says, follow me. He doesn't just say, go that way. He invites us to walk with him, to follow him along the way. And so what that means for us is that he empowers us and equips us, giving us not only the direction that we need to go, but the power to do what it is that he's called us to do. In other words, Jesus Christ, in calling us to be like Him, to serve, He enables us and empowers us by giving us gifts that help us to fulfill what it is that He's calling us to do. And there's a particular passage in Scripture that I want to invite you to. It's in the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4, that's going to connect these things together, going to connect this idea of, of, uh, of gifts that God gives us as well as this idea of growing into the person that God wants us to be. And so what I want to do this morning is I want you to notice these two things, and prayerfully you'll see how they're connected. This idea of Jesus Christ giving us gifts that enable us to follow Him, that enable us to do what He's called us to do, and in that He causes us to grow. And so the title of this message this morning is The Way That God Grows His Church. I want to talk to you out of Ephesians chapter 4, verses 7 through 16, the way that God grows His church. And so I want you to notice these things, and I'm going to point them out even as we're reading, this idea of God giving us gifts and then God causing us to grow. Listen to the Bible, Ephesians chapter 4 at verse 7. Grace was given to each one of us, look at this language, according to the measure of Christ's gift. So what has Christ done? He has given us grace according to His own gift. So whatever He gives us, whatever He calls us to do, listen to this, is an outflowing of His own life. Don't miss this. Don't think about this idea that you're called to serve Jesus isolated and alone. No, the life of God, listen to this, the life of God through the power of the Spirit is lived out in your everyday life. And so Jesus Christ to himself, the Bible calls him in another book, the indescribable gift of heaven, uh, the, the gift that can't even be described, this Jesus Christ has given us grace. Look at this language, according to the measure of Christ's gift. Now that's, a, that's what I want to talk about today, the whole idea behind that, that, the whole idea behind that phrase, the measure of Christ's gift. And thankfully, the Lord God is going to show us what that means. Let's keep reading. For example, verse 8. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men, that is, or to people. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions of the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. Look at verse 11. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, the teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind and doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, look at this language, we are to grow up in every way into Him who is the head into Christ. 
from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow up so that it builds itself up in love. You see, God is dedicated to performing His task on this earth in and through me and you. God has so called us. This is God's design. This is the way that God wants things. You may think that there was a better way for God to reveal His glory, for God to have His way on this earth. But no, He has put the Holy Spirit of the living God, His very presence, into your life. And from that, you get to experience what it means, and according to verse 15, you get to grow up in every way into Him who is the head, into Christ. And so God right now, remember when we've talked about this desire that God has to grow, we're supposed to understand that when we talk about God's growth plan, that is not some strategy that we have as a church, but us individually realizing who God has called us to be and performing the function that God's called us to, not according to our power, not according to our ways, but by surrendering to serve whatever He says, however He says. And as a result, look at the result here in verse 16, when every part is working properly, then we'll grow so that we'll build ourselves up in love. And so, for example, when you think about the way that God grows His church, the mechanism or the means by which God grows His church is by equipping you and me, us individually, to serve Him wherever we are, as a parent, as a teacher, as a grandparent, wherever we are this morning, we are to, as a professional, wherever, you're to serve Jesus Christ with the gift that He has given you. And so what I want to do this morning is I want to just walk through this passage, and I want to talk to you about uh, our call to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Serving Him is the way that we grow into Him. After all, remember what He said? He said, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. And so in other words, if we're going to look like Jesus, then we're going to have to serve. We are most like Jesus. Listen to me. We are most like Jesus Christ when we serve. And you think about in particular how amazing that is that we should even say such a thing, that the God of the universe would humble himself enough to come to me and you, who are the most needy, who are the most desperate, who needed it the most, and he was willing to do whatever it took to demonstrate just how much he loves us. And remember what he did, and I'm getting ahead of myself, but that's okay. Remember what he did. He gave his life as the supreme example of what it means to serve. And so let's talk about service this morning, and I want to make sure that you understand this. Number one, write this down. You are saved to serve. The reason that God has set you apart, the reason that he has put you on a pathway that led to regret, a pathway that led to death, shame, hell, God has taken you from that pathway and given you a new path. And that path that he's given you is called abundant life. Don't, don't miss this. Jesus says, I have come that they may have life. Remember? But not just life, is it? It's an abundant life. What's the abundant life? Money, riches? No, none of that. The abundant life is serving. The abundant life is in your circumstances, no matter where you are, becoming more and more like Jesus. That's what it means. And so here's this example that we have. Jesus Christ, he says this at verse 7. Grace was given to each one of us. Now, do you see this personal aspect here that God has for you? This is the message that God has to his church, yes, but this is the message that God has to you individually. Don't miss this. Grace was given to every person here. How did God give his grace? He gave that grace, notice this next thing, according to the measure of Christ's gift. Now, here's a question. Let's just think about this for just a minute. How do you quantify Christ's gift? How do you quantify the treasure of heaven without seeking, listen to this, without seeking to be what he was, he became what he was not so that he could make us as he is. He didn't cease to be God. When he came and took on flesh, he united himself. 
He united God with man in Jesus Christ. The condescension, the amazing grace that it took, the love that motivated God from eternity to send his only son, to give his only son to you as a gift. For example, look at this language in Ephesians chapter 2. Go here. Ephesians chapter 2. Look at verse 8. All right, let's start at verse 4. It's good enough to go back. Verse 4, God being rich in mercy. And there again is this idea of, of how do we measure something. Rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. Here's our story. Listen to it. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. Notice that. It's not that you had everything figured out. It's not that you had some hidden potential. It's God saw you when you were dead. God saw you when you were dead in your sins. You were dead in your sins. And when you were dead in your sins, that's when he loved you. Don't miss that, beloved. It's when you were dead in your sins. That's when God loved you. It says this too. It says that when you were dead in your trespasses, he has made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In other words, when the Bible says by grace, you have been saved, he's saying, this is what I mean. Uh, By being when you were dead and now you've been made alive, the way that you understand that term is just simply by saying by grace, you have been saved. We move from death to life through Christ, but it gets richer. Notice verse six and raised us up with him seated us with him in the heavenly places. That's where you are right now, in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages, look at this language, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us. So that in the coming ages, don't miss this, so that in the coming ages, he might show us the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us who are in Christ Jesus. Now, here's the verse that all of you know. Here's the verse that all of you recognize. Look look at it, verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It's the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. And oftentimes, if you grew up in a wanna like I did, that's the place that you stopped. In order to get your badge, in order to get the next... Uh, ribbon, whatever it was, that's the place that we stop. But the Bible doesn't stop there. Listen to verse 10. I want you to find yourself at verse 10. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You know what that means? Jesus Christ had a plan before the ages began to create a pathway for your feet to walk. Not in your own power, but in the power of the Holy Spirit. God has something that he is working out in your life. He has something that he desires to accomplish in and through you. You see, you're saved to serve. You know what that means? It means that you're significant. You say, well, I struggle with an inferiority complex. Well, you know what? I didn't learn about the imposter syndrome until I was taking my PhD coursework in seminary. And man, that stuff's a real thing, right? But listen, listen, it's not about inferiority. It's about you considering your circumstances and your reality the way that God sees you. And you say, well, how does God see me? Well, listen to it again. You are his workmanship. What does that mean? It means that the God of the universe who created the stars, who with his hand dug out the canyons and the, and the seafloor, this God who spoke and the stars came into existence, this God is working on you. This God desires to take your life and use it for his purpose. And see, that's where the challenge is too. Because we would rather God use our life for our purpose. We think sometimes that we know best. We think sometimes that we know better. Paul had the same kind of uh, attitude in 2 Corinthians when he prayed for God to remove whatever circumstances he was in. He said he prayed three times for God to remove uh, his, his thorn in the flesh, he calls it. But you know what God answered? God answered him the same way every time. My grace is sufficient for you. 
Why is that? Because you're His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. You know what this means? Created in Christ Jesus? Jesus Christ has come to reorient the whole world according to who He is. Jesus Christ, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, listen to this, He's the last Adam. I know some of you Sunday school teachers like to say second Adam. Stop saying that, okay? The Bible doesn't say that. He's the last Adam. You say, why not the second? Because second means that there may be a third. Stop saying second Adam. He's the last Adam. All right, theological tangent over. Now, He's the last Adam. You know what that means? It means that He has come to reorder the entire world according to Himself. In the first Adam, there was death. In the first Adam, there was a realization of our shame. There was a disobedience. There was pursuing our own intentions, our own purpose, our own desire, walking not in a path of God in the cool of the day, but walking in the expulsion of the Garden of Eden. But Jesus Christ has come, and He's replaced our shame. He's replaced our fear. He's replaced our rejection by acceptance. He has looked at our sins that brought about a separation from God, and He says, you give me all of it. You give me all of your sin. You give me all of your burden. You give me all of your shame. And I will say, I will will take what's yours, and I'll give you what's mine. I'll take righteousness, excuse me, I will take your sin and I will give you my righteousness so that now in me, whatever's true of me is now true of you by faith. You see, God has saved you not to just sit, not to just come to church and just wait for this thing to all go by and, and have things your way. God has a ordained path that He wants your life to walk. And that ordained path is simple. Listen to it. It just means serving Him. It just means doing what He says. It means you and your circumstances, not just thinking that this news came to you and it took God by surprise, but God, either He calls whatever it is to come in your life or He allowed it. And the question is, how does what happened in your life equate to what God has prepared beforehand for you to walk in. Beloved, you're saved to serve. Now, number two, second thing for us to learn is when we serve, it means fighting. When we serve the Lord, that's how we engage in the warfare that He's called us to. Remember, Jesus Christ walked into a world that was filled full of darkness. Remember, He came into a world and was rejected by His own. He told us that all of us who desire to live this way, godly in Christ Jesus, there will be persecution. Why is that? Because we have an enemy who desires to keep us down, an enemy who desires to keep us satisfied, an enemy who would love nothing more than the people of First Baptist Startville to not get a hold of this calling that God has upon each one of your life to serve Him, or as we say it here, to live sent. And remember what we mean when we say live sent? We want to follow Jesus and invite everyone to come along with us. What does that mean? It means that that inevitably means that if we're following Jesus, then we've forsaken all other paths. Jesus Christ has given you a gift. And that gift is secured by his own death on the cross and resurrection from the grave. And he did that so that he could disarm the principalities and powers. Look at this language. He says that he gave gifts to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Look at verse 8. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, look at this language. He led a host of captives. He is the conquering king who has come. He led a host of captives. And then what did he do? He He gave gifts to men. The bounty and the spoil of his salvation, all that he accomplished for us. He, he took the keys from death and hell. He took, 
and the sting out of death itself, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And now he empowers you by the power of the Holy Spirit to serve as his ambassadors, to walk into whatever arena you're in as a parent, as a, as a mother, as a young professional, as a father, as a brother, as a professor, to, as a student, to walk into every profession, every classroom, every setting, and you get to say, Jesus Christ is King. Jesus Christ has conquered the grave. Jesus Christ is Lord over these circumstances. It's an amazing thing to me when we think about the way that God has gifted us. He uses us to serve as his ambassadors, to walk onto a field that hasn't yet been conquered, that hasn't yet realized the kingdom of God is at hand. And we go and we proclaim that. We go and we tell the whole world, listen to it. Our message is the same message of Jesus. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Change your mind. Change your direction. Because there is an eternity that's awaiting every man. And there's only one way to have life. There's only one way to have hope. And it's through Jesus Christ. There's no other way other than him. We have a real enemy. Jesus Christ uses your life to shame the enemy. You think about, for example, the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians chapter 5. After all these gifts that he gives are grace gifts, the potential that God has for you to fill out individually is not the fruits of the Spirit. Listen carefully. It's the fruit of the Spirit. And so this morning, if you're called to be a leader... If you're called to display mercy, if you're called with the gift of administration, whatever the gifting is that God has for you, God then takes that and produces fruit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. All of those things are fruits that our world is desperately looking for. Love, the Spirit produces love because God himself is love. And there is no such thing as love outside of Jesus. My preacher used to say, uh, this was growing up, my preacher used to say, talking about puppy love, you know, this, this infatuation that uh, tweens and young adults have with each other, puppy love. He used to say, well, you know, it may be puppy love, but it sure is love to the puppy, that kind of thing. Well, our world is, is looking out, and they're seeing what is, they think is love, but it's really not love. Peace, our world desperately wants peace. How does peace come? The only way we know to bring peace is to drop a bigger bomb than the next guy, right? That's the way that we bring peace. Jesus Christ, how did he bring peace? He brought peace by giving his life as a ransom for men. God takes your life and he reorients the way the world thinks. He came to bring peace, not a sword. He came to turn the world upside down. Philippians chapter 2 says, Have this mind in you which was also in Christ Jesus who didn't regard equality a thing to be grasped. He counted others more significant than himself. You know what the cross shows us? Listen to this. The cross of Christ shows us the omnipotence of God. You say, what's omnipotence? It means all power. The way that God demonstrated he was all powerful is by dying on a cross. And in that, not only did he show his omnipotence, he also showed his omniscience. You say, what is that? That means all-knowing. He showed that what he knows is better. Because the wisdom of God is wiser than any of man's wisdom. And here is this God who shows us wisdom by the folly of the cross. And he takes your life and he says, follow me. He says, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they'll persecute you. He came into his world that he created, a world that rejected him, all on purpose. 
He knew that he was going to be rejected, and yet he still came. And he has called us to serve him. And when we serve him, remember what Ephesians 6 says. Ephesians 6 says that our battle is not against flesh and blood. That's not who we're fighting against. We're fighting against cosmic powers. We're fighting against principalities and authorities that have a hold on this world. But Jesus Christ has saved you to serve. And then he's called you to live out that spiritual act of worship and service to him. And when you serve him according to his ways, by showing you shame the enemy, you show Jesus Christ, you show the world that Jesus Christ is better. You show the world that Jesus Christ is the most awesome. Even if the world doesn't understand why it is that you, for example, apologize more than others. I had that happen to me the other day. I needed to apologize to Katie. And I knew I needed to, but I didn't want to. You ever had that happen? We were riding down the road, and we're riding down the road. You know, we hadn't talked, one of these kind of things where she's not talking, I'm not talking. Titus is in the back seat, he's not talking. You know, we're just riding down the road. And it just all of a sudden hit me. You need to say, I'm sorry. I winced out loud. And Katie said, what's wrong with you? And I said, I can't tell you what's wrong with me. (laughs) It doesn't make any sense sometimes for God to lead us the way that he leads us. For us to be humble. For us to be kind. For us to not take matters into our own hands. But instead to trust him. But that's what he's called us to do. The weapons of our warfare are completely different. And Jesus Christ gives you a gift. And when you serve others, you're fighting the good fight of faith. The third thing for us to write down is this. If we're going to grow, then that means that we're going to serve. If we're going to grow, then it means we're going to serve. Notice this in verse 11. Here's Christ's gift. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and and teachers. And some of you may be reading that and you say, well, those are not my gifts. I'm not there in that list. Look at verse 12. To equip the saints for the work of the ministry. All of those gifts that God gives are on purpose. Not so that the prophets and the apostles and the evangelists and the shepherds and the teachers can do the work of the ministry but so that those gifts can equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. And you may say, well, I didn't hear my name called at verse 11. Oh, but you heard it at verse 12, didn't you? Because that's all of us. We have been equipped by God with the gifts that he's given. Look at this language, to build up the body of Christ. You know what this means? It means that if we as a church are going to grow, and you individually have to grow. If we are going to grow, and what does growth mean? Listen, it doesn't necessarily mean numerics, right? It means impact. Our motivation as a church here is to grow because we want the world, uh, we want Starkville, Mississippi State, and the rest of the world to know that Jesus Christ is King. We want to take seriously his commandment because as the days grow darker out there, it's more of an opportunity for us to do what he's called us to do. It's a greater opportunity for us because the world needs it. And the only way that we're going to build one another in love, the only way that we're going to have a a body of Christ that's building up is if we individually are maturing into the man and the woman that God has called us to be. You say, what does that mean? It means you looking more and more like Jesus. You say, which part of Jesus? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it's the mercy part. Maybe that's your gift. Maybe it's the exhortation part. Because Christ, he was an exhort. Maybe that's your gift. But here we all get to come together and we get to grow. And if we're going to grow, the only way that we can grow is we have to serve. We have to be willing to say, God, 
I'm going to do whatever it is you call me to do. Even if that means sacrifice. Even if that means loss. Because it's really no loss at all. Because I'm going to consider myself just like Jesus. And God has something that he wants us to do. Look at verse 13. Attain to the unity of the faith in the knowledge of the Son of God. You know, it's a shame that many people can come to church just like you do on a regular basis and you know all about God, but you don't really know Him. You know, you can tell the story, you can quote the 66 books, you can quote the passages in the book, but you don't know Him. And you'll never know Him unless you're willing to do what He did. You'll never know Him unless you're willing to serve. This is because, and listen, service is hard. It means giving up your preferences. It means giving up your desires. That's sort of what it's all about, isn't it? It means denying yourself. It means counting others more significant than yourself and serving. And remember the reason we do that. Is because Christ has not only shown us that, has not only called us to that, but Jesus Christ has enabled us to do that. The way that he enabled us to do that is by giving his life, conquering death, and sending the Spirit. Fourth and finally, this is a question. How is it that you're going to serve? Hopefully it's clear. God wants us to grow. God wants us to become like Jesus. Becoming like Jesus means serving. We serve in the power that He's given us. We serve according to His authority. We serve according to what he says. Now it's your responsibility to discover how it is that you're going to serve. Look again, for example, at verse 11. See if you hear your name here. He gave the apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. You say, not me. Look at verse 12. To equip the saints for the work of the ministry... For building up the body of Christ. Look at verse 14. So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by weaves, excuse me, waves carried about by every wind and doctrine. Rather speaking the truth in love. Look at this. We are to grow up in every way into him who's the head. And here's verse 16. This is where we all have to pay attention. Because every one of us, it's our responsibility to find how we're gifted. It's our responsibility to find and answer the question, how is it that God, how is it that I'm going to serve? Not if I'm called to serve, but how is it, God, that you want me to serve? Verse 16, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which is it equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. You know what that tells us? It tells us that if we're working properly, then we're building ourselves up in love. But the opposite is true. If we're not working properly, then there'll be no building. There'll be no building up of ourselves in love. And it's your responsibility to ask God the question presented to you at point number four. How is it, Lord, that you've called me to serve? Now, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to develop an entire sermon series to leave you without excuse. We're going to start that not next week, but the next week where I'm going to come and I'm going to show you how God has gifted you to serve Him. Amen? Father in heaven, we thank you so much for loving us. We thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to save us. And Father, we know what that saving means. 
It means not to just watch the world go by, but it means, Lord God, for us to understand that your sacrifice was to enable us to serve you. Father, if there's anyone here who doesn't know you, may their first act of service this morning be to give their life wholly to you. Father, help our church to grow. Growing, Lord God, into the mature manhood. Growing, Lord God, into maturity so that every one of us looks more and more like Jesus. And so that, Lord God, when the city of Starkville and the state of Mississippi, when they think of First Baptist Church in Starkville, their first thought is, man, those people sure do remind me of Jesus. Help us, Lord God, in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. We hope that you enjoyed this message from First Baptist Startwell. And if you did, make sure to subscribe so you can listen to our sermons as soon as they're available every week. If you'd like more information about how you can live sent at First Baptist Startwell, please visit fbcstartwell.com slash connect.